Hi there, my name is James Lee. Welcome to my channel 5149, where I talk business, politics, and society. Today, I wanna to talk about Oatly. Wow, wow, no cow, no, 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 wow, wow, no cow, no, 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 wow, wow. In case we didn't already know from the carton, the CEO of Oatly wants to make it super clear that Oatly makes milk from oats, not cows. Anyway, I wanna examine Oatly to discuss the broader question, is corporate sustainability actually sustainable? Right now, corporate social responsibility or corporate sustainability typically consists of a Steve Jobs lookalike who has been trotted out there by a big corporation to stand in front of a wall covered by fake green shrubbery to talk about how they're gonna be carbon neutral by 2030 or 2050 or some absurd timeline in the future or it consists of advertisements that cater to some traditionally marginalized group like gay people or women or minorities without actually doing much to improve the lives of those people. And I think at this point, most of us have come to realize that all they're trying to do with this type of stuff is try to buy a little breathing room while they run up profits to all time highs. But Oatly seems genuinely different promising to be a good company, one that strives to always deliver products that have maximum nutritional value and minimum environmental impact, and a good company that believes that helping people upgrade their lives always comes before the reckless pursuit of profit. Each year, they publish a sustainability report that highlights the good, the bad, and the ugly. So today, I'm gonna to use that same framework to discuss whether their human-centered capitalist mission is sustainable in the long term. Let's start with the good. From a business perspective, they are A-plus marketers. Their advertisements are funny, they're self-deprecating, eye-catching, and almost makes you forget that oat milk is just a commodity. Oatly's chief creative officer, John Schoolcraft, explained that one of his first moves after joining Oatly was to replace the marketing department with a department of mind control. And this mind control is working pretty good as Oatly has experienced incredible revenue growth and has also just gone public a few weeks ago. But beyond that, while researching this piece, I found much of their communication to be very transparent and self-aware, at least as much as a corporation can be. Their 2018 sustainability report tagline read, slightly worse than last year, whereby they admitted that some of their sustainability metrics weren't as good as the previous year. And interestingly, in their IPO perspectives, they also acknowledge that their provocative marketing campaigns could be a risk to their business, writing, we have also historically engaged in provocative and unconventional marketing and advertising campaigns as part of our marketing strategy to enhance and maintain our brand, which may expose us to lawsuits and heightened scrutiny from regulators in the markets in which we operate, as well as interest groups such as dairy lobbyists. That's a first, and I would say that's pretty self-aware based on all the ads I've seen. Uh, but besides the business acumen, perhaps the best of the good is how they treat their employees. And according to their website, Oatly strives to offer more than the legal minimum in each country. For example, in the US, Oatly offers competitive and comprehensive medical, dental, vision, and life insurance, as well as disability coverage, and covers 100% of the premium for the employee on the medical plan and employees plus dependents for dental and vision compared with the average company paying only 60% of the premium. So based on my research, they do things that other corporations don't typically do, and this has generated incredible brand equity in what is really just a commoditized beverage business. So kudos. Switching gears to the bad, I wanna cover a few of the criticisms that have been levied against the company by activists and journalists, because uh, let's face it, when you've built your entire brand by being in people's faces about how good a company you are, how sustainable you are, people are naturally gonna to wanna to poke around a little bit. So in terms of sustainability, according to a 2018 Oxford University study, oat milk takes less land and energy to produce than dairy milk and emits fewer greenhouse gases. But it also beats other plant-based milk alternatives in its environmental impact. All good things that Oatly has capitalized on in their marketing campaigns to try to convince consumers to ditch dairy in favor of oat milk. But with all things to do with the environment, it's not that straightforward. Now, I'm not an expert in agriculture at all, but based on my research, oats also destroy soil. Oats require a tremendous amount of nitrogen and studies have shown that adding nitrogen to the soil not only ends up depleting the soil's nitrogen, but it also impairs the ability of the soil to retain nitrogen. Over time, more and more nitrogen is needed until the land is completely useless. And then not only can food not be grown in this land, the land will not sequester carbon, leading to excess greenhouse gas emissions. 
Like I said, I'm not an expert in agriculture, but that does not sound super sustainable. And then last fall, Oatly drew a lot of backlash from activists when they received a $200 million investment from Blackstone, a major private equity firm that has ties to two Brazilian companies that are reportedly linked with deforestation in the Amazon. Oatly defended its decision by saying, quote, Blackstone is like the biggest supermarket of the private equity sector. We thought that if we could convince them that it's as profitable and in the long term even more profitable to invest in a sustainability company like Oatly, then all other private equity firms of the world would start to look, listen, and start to steer their collective worth of four trillion US dollars into green investments. Okay, maybe, yeah, I could buy that. Um, so I'll withhold judgment here and see how things go. But uh, beyond marketing their sustainability, Oatly's packaging also kind of implies that it's healthy with taglines like no milk, no soy, no badness. So while it's true that they don't have any milk or soy in their product, a cup of oat milk does have almost the same amount of sugar compared to a can of Coke and almost as many grams of industrial seed oil as a medium serving of McDonald's french fries. Coke and french fries, while very delicious, don't exactly represent the pinnacle of health. So essentially they're kind of doing this thing of highlighting what ingredients they don't have as a misdirection to distract from ingredients that are included but might be considered not so healthy. So much so that some have even compared Oatly's advertisements to that of Big Tobacco and Big Sugar from yesteryear. Now in their defense, I don't think Oatly has ever made any explicit health claims beyond what ingredients it doesn't have, along with some vague feel-good claims. So, you know, my thoughts on this are that we all have our vices, and unless we are downing oat milk in crazy quantities, my guess is that there are worse beverages out there that we consume on the regular that could potentially be much worse for our health. So what about the ugly? Well, I think it's their decision to take the company public. As of May 20th, 2021, Oatly is listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange, so you can now own a piece of Oatly. I know what you might be thinking, this seems kind of like an odd call out for being an ugly, because don't public companies have to disclose much more information versus private companies? They do, but hear me out for a second, because I think this gets at the core question I asked at the beginning of the video, which is whether or not corporate sustainability is actually sustainable in the long term. Look, I'll admit that I'm naturally kind of a cynical guy, at least when it comes to my view about corporations, but I do think that the folks running Oatly are generally good people who want to do good. Like their website says, they have this Swedish mentality, which to me is like very business oriented, definitely capitalist. I don't know if you remember, but a couple videos back, I mentioned that Sweden has one of the highest concentrations of billionaires, but they also have a strong social safety net in place and generally have a higher regard for workers compared to, you know, America. A little plug for last week's video. Anyway, I see Oatly as having basically the same qualities. They're looking to grow, they're looking to make some more money, but they also care about humanity, both in terms of the environment and their people. But now that this little Swedish underdog has gone public, can they actually resist the immense pressure placed upon them by global capitalism? Because let's face it, once you're public, the many stakeholders who you once valued will inevitably be replaced by one stakeholder, your shareholders. And to those shareholders, you have but one task, make the money as much of it as possible. And in terms of market dynamics, stock value is typically driven by growth and by profit. Just speculating, but how do you think growth will impact sustainability? If you're expected to grow 10 to 20% a year, which is kind of like the baseline Wall Street expectation, that kind of growth comes with the need for more robust production, more land, more destruction of fertile soil like I talked about earlier, more shipping as your market size increases. So I can imagine that sustainability report going from slightly worse than last year to a lot worse than last year in a hurry. And they are already facing these types of compromising situations. When asked what were the top challenges of 2019, Oatly's sustainability team responded, our company growth, and more specifically, the complexity that comes with it. Sometimes we need to find production solutions really fast, which of course is fine and necessary, but it tends to complicate the climate impact measurements and follow up. After growth comes profit. Right now, Oatly is not profitable. In 2020, they lost over $60 million, up from losing $35 million the year before. Once again, I'm just speculating here, but how do you think the pursuit of profit will impact your cost structure? Can you still afford to pay your workers the way you want? Maybe your employees will still be taken care of fairly well and they'll be happy, but maybe you start classifying fewer and fewer people as employees. 
Maybe you rely more on seasonal workers and contractors, creating a kind of two-class bifurcation we've seen at many other large corporations. You know, I think many companies start out with the right mission and good intentions. And when you're a small company, when you're a small private company specifically, you can more successfully resist the temptations that come with capital. But when you go public, that's Pandora's box open and you cannot undo it. Google famously ingrained this motto of don't be evil for a long time, and it had been a part of the company's corporate code of conduct since 2000. But by the time Google reorganized as Alphabet in 2015, don't be evil morphed into quote unquote doing the right thing, which is somewhat a bit more ambiguous. And by 2018, don't be evil disappeared altogether from their code of conduct. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't have a crystal ball to predict what's in store for Oatly and other companies like it who promise a brighter future for capitalism. But based on my examination of the past, they're about to find out how strong their convictions really are. Thank you so much for watching. I think this is a story that I'm gonna hopefully revisit at a later date to see what's transpired, but I hope my analysis today was fair. Uh, my feelings are that uh, nobody's pure here. We all participate in the system in one way or another. There's no need to jump the gun and say, oh, we need to boycott so-and-so or this and that. Uh, like most of my videos, I try my best to digest the information and relay it to you in a way that you can then make your own decisions and conclusions and maybe formulate additional philosophical thought on how we can best approach the complex problems we face together as a society. So if you appreciate my work, please don't be shy about hitting the like button, share this video with your friends and family, and also subscribe um, so then you can get notified the next time I post a video. As always, thank you so much for your time and I will see you next week.